not just for people born into extreme poverty or violence or disability, though uh, such claims would be controversial enough, but better for everyone never to have been, and we mean everyone. Uh, David Benatar shows that there are a number of well-documented features of human psychology that explain why uh, people overestimate the quality of their lives and why they are thus resistant to the suggestion that they are seriously harmed by being brought into existence. Just very briefly, the book argues that all our lives are very bad and generally much worse than we think. So we are systematically and significantly mistaken about their value. We shouldn't have children. Women should have early abortions. The abortion debate on the whole is between the pro-life and the pro-choice lobbies. Uh, the professor holds a candle for the pro-death view. He thinks that any woman needs excellent reasons not to abort her child. He hopes that one day all humans and all other animals will be extinct. He does make a distinction between coming into and continuing to exist. It's better not to come into existence, but once we are around, once we are around, we might as well have some fun since su suicide is an unpleasant business. These are startling claims, I admit. Uh, they are straightforward, I believe, and... Uh, the, the, you, it, it makes you question life. Although the good things in one's life might make it go better than it otherwise would have gone, one could have been deprived by their absence if one had not existed. You know what I mean? So all the positive existence, uh, the positive experiences we use to justify our lives, to argue that it's better to be alive than not to be alive at all. Those who never exist cannot be deprived. So if you <laughs> love it, uh, those who never exist cannot feel pain, you can't feel joy, you can't feel anything. However, by coming into existence, one does suffer some serious harms that could not have befallen one had one not come into existence. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. Uh, the professor joins us in the studio. A very good morning to you, professor. And of course, he's the head of philosophy department at the University of Cape Town. Good morning, Prof. Good morning, nice to be with you. Thank you so much. I love being alive. What are you telling me? Well, once you're alive, if you're enjoying it, then continue. That's great. <laughs> but uh, had you not been here, there would be nobody to have missed what you're enjoying. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> so there would have been nobody to have the good and the bad experiences of life. So wh how do we conclude then you're better off not having come into existence? I wouldn't have uh, experienced some of the pleasures that I've experienced. So I'm better off having experienced them. Well, look at what you've just said. You said you wouldn't have experienced the pleasures, but you wouldn't have been. And so there would have been nobody who would have been deprived of your pleasures. It's not the same as you're existing without the pleasures. Mm -hmm. If you don't exist, there is nobody there who's being deprived. Wow. H how different is your theory or your philosophy from the existentialist uh, movement, existentialism? Well, existentialism is a very broad movement mm -hmm. and includes a number of different thinkers with different views. There's some very optimistic existentialists, some which are more pessimistic. Uh, so I think one could characterize my inquiry as a kind of existentialist inquiry and the questions that I'm asking is existentialist questions. But of course, I've got a particular take on those. I give a particular set of answers that may differ from other existentialists. Mm. Prof, what has been the response to your book? Because, you know, you, you're dealing with some very controversial subjects that many people would find quite uncomfortable to delve into. Indeed. Well, the reactions have been very mixed. Uh, first of all, there have been many people who've responded viscerally and quite angrily to what I've said, many of whom have confessed not even to having read the book. They've read some kind of blurb somewhere or they've just heard the title and they're responding instinctively with a great deal of anger. And uh, many of them are leveling objections which, had they read the book, they will see have been considered and responded to. Uh, on the other hand, there have been people who disagreed with me and who've attempted to argue very carefully and clearly for why they disagree with me and it's been pleasant to engage in uh, a philosophical discussion with those sorts of people. And then there has been a small minority of people who've written and said, gee, this sounds exactly right. Mm -hmm. But but I said earlier, and I don't know if this is a, a fair um, assessment of, of, of your work or your book, that uh, it is leaning towards nihilism. Uh, I, I mean, w if we talk about nihilism, are, are we saying that life has no purpose, uh, that existence itself has no intrinsic value? What exactly is it? Well, I would disagree with your characterization of my view as a nihilistic mm -hmm. view. Of course, it does depend on what one means by the word nihilism. But sure. if by nihilism one means uh, a rejection of any kind of value, 
then my view is not nihilistic at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, my arguments proceed from values that almost everybody holds. So my pre the premises of my argument are actually values that everybody holds. And what I try to show is that the implications of those values are ones which are quite radical and which most people don't recognize or realize. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, Prof, we, I, I really believe that all of us as human beings, we do have a choice. Even people who commit suicide, that is a choice, a choice to cease uh, to exist. But for those of us who are already in existence, you and I, we already uh, are, are living, we've come into being. What is the option? Do you continue to exist or do we lament the fact that it is better not to have existed? Well, uh, I think there are a variety of ideas that you've raised there. Uh, first of all, I do want to clarify that I'm not recommending suicide. No, of course uh, not. It, no. it may be true that some people's lives are so bad that they, on due reflection, decide that ending their lives is best. I don't think anybody should ever rush into a decision like that. It obviously has an impact not only on them, but on family members and those who are close to them. Uh, so it is an option, but I think it's an option that has to be very carefully considered, not rushed into, something that's discussed with other people. Uh, but my focus in the book is not on ending lives, it's on whether we should start lives. And my worry is that the optimistic view, the view that our lives are all just fine, that leads to the creation of new lives and new suffering. So while I think that while we're here we should enjoy our lives, I'm very concerned about the creation of new centers of suffering as it were. Hmm. Every time one has a child, you're creating somebody who could suffer an immense amount. And the one thing that you can absolutely guarantee, the way, one way you can absolutely guarantee that any child of yours will not suffer is not to have that child. Sure. So, so, so what are you saying, Prof? Are we overestimating the, the, the quality of our lives, the things that, for, for instance, bring us joy? We associate uh, life, the beginning of life, a new baby, as a new beginning. So do we overestimate the quality of all those things? Absolutely, and I think here it's quite important to get scientific because there's actually very good and quite extensive psychological data on this phenomenon of, of human optimism and the uh, inclination to view life as, as being very good. There are a number of well-documented, well-researched features of human psychology which demonstrate that we do overestimate the quality of our lives. And I don't think that this scientific evidence can just be readily ignored. So when people say to me, but I'm very happy to be alive and I think my life is just great. They can't say that without ignoring the scientific evidence. 021-446-0567 or double one double eight three zero seven zero two. We are talking about life. It's a philosophical discussion and we are exploring the question, are our lives much worse than we think? Uh, David Benatar, Professor David Benatar's book, Better Never to Have Been the Harm of Coming into Existence. Let's talk about it. What are your views on this one? We're not condemning anybody. Uh, we're not prescribing to people how they should view life, but we're exchanging ideas about what we make of this journey called life. Prof, just going back to the meaning of the word existence, I mean, it, it is a philosophically interesting notion, very familiar but elusive. And I say familiar because we are living life, we have a rhythm, but I also say elusive because it, it seems we do have a difficulty in saying exactly what existence is, or does it differ from one person to another? I agree with you that existence is a philosophically complex word and certainly when we apply it to human beings there are interesting questions about what it means to exist. There's obviously a brute sort of biological sense in which we can exist but then we could have the biological existence without say the conscious existence and that's true of, um, of young uh, embryos and fetuses and it could be true of people who are uh, brain dead but biologically alive. So those are interesting questions and what I'm mainly interested in is really the uh, sentient existence but I also have some interest in the other kinds of existence. Hmm. Let's go straight to the lines. Is it Davi in Bryanston? Yeah, it's me. Yes, hello. Good morning. Um, uh, uh, just a comment. Uh, I, I think uh, the professor is making a logical sense, and I can't disagree with his, with his uh, uh, logic, but, but I think uh, we as humans are genetically programmed to, to, um, well, to celebrate life and to be optimistic. So although your arguments, I think, logically certainly hold water, I don't think it is really relevant simply because we are differently programmed and we are programmed to be optimistic and we are programmed uh, to have children and to make sure that our genes uh, are going to the next generation and so on. So although it's very interesting and logically perhaps correct, it's really not relevant because we are a genetic being. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that, Prof? 
Well, uh, I agree that there are deep uh, biological bases for uh, our life drive and for our optimism, but I don't think it follows from that that what I say is not relevant. I think it's clearly going to follow that most people are going to want to reject what I say for deep uh, biological reasons, but I don't think that what I say is irrelevant. After all, there are many other deep uh, biologically based uh, drives that people have, including drives towards aggression. Uh, prejudices can have a biological explanation. Uh, but we don't think that these things are acceptable merely because they're biologically based. We need to evaluate our instincts and we need to uh, assess whether they're appropriate or inappropriate. Hmm. Let's go to Vimpi in Limbro Park. Hi. Hello, Reedy. How are you? Fine, thank you. I just want to say that um, I cannot agree with the professor more. I, I feel life has not changed. It hasn't changed since my forefathers. Twenty years ago, when my, my wife and I got married, we decided we're not going to have children because of the fact that life doesn't change. We are still doing things exactly the same way that our parents used to do things. Hmm. So, so hold on, Vimpi. Are you saying that this actually informed your decision not to have children? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you've been married because 25 it, years. Yes, and it's an absolute conscious decision that we made. Um, if you look at around you, people are suffering. We, 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 life is not getting better. But have the moments of joy of found, finding your wife and whatever, does that not give more meaning to your existence or not? 100%. But there's also, there's also a matter of reason. Hmm. And, and one has to look at life and say, can, can, you, can you really change it? Yes, I can, by not bringing another life into this, onto this planet that goes through exactly the same mundane existence that, w that we do from day to day. Wow. Wow, Vimpi. Thank you. So you, have to, you have to look at life in a very macabre way. In a very macabre way? Yes, because you know what? <laughs> look, I enjoy my life and I enjoy traveling and, 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 and I'm fortunate enough with a lovely wife. Yes. But nothing changes. Hmm. You, you know, it's, it's, it's a... Uh, we have the ability to change our future. Wow, okay. M may, may I come in? Yes, please. Well, I, I, I want to point out that there are a number of people, of course it's a small minority of all people, but there are a number of people like our caller who have consciously decided not to have children. And uh, I would endorse uh, the caller's sentiments. Uh, and I think we need to distinguish again between what gives us pleasure once we're already here, and I think those are important. It's important to have a better life rather than a worse life once you're here. But that's a separate question from whether starting a life is a good thing. Hmm. Because whenever you start a life, you're creating a center of suffering. You're creating a being that can suffer and will suffer a great deal. Whatever pleasures that being has, that will mitigate in some way the pains. But the pain that you're creating is completely unnecessary. I, I, I guess, Prof, I mean, as you're saying this, I'm just thinking, isn't there a certain... <laughs> What's the word I'm looking for? A certain dichotomy that surrounds our existence. We're here one moment and gone the next. You are alive and dead the next. You live, you die. Uh, death is scary, but life can be amazing. It can be, and there are people who enjoy it, but I don't think that's the relevant question. Mm -hmm. I think the relevant question is, once you consider the two alternatives of sure. never existing or coming into existence, uh, it seems to me that there are certain advantages. Uh, 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 there are certain advantages to n to never coming into existence that don't apply in the other in the other direction. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you completely. Let's go to uh, Sarah in Four Ways. Hi, Reedy. Hi. Good morning, and good morning to Professor Benita. Um, Reedy, when I heard your topic this morning, I got so excited because I thought to myself, here is a man, the only man I've ever heard of speaking my language. Um, really, my mother passed away recently, and it really got me questioning the meaning of life. And if one looks at the damage that mankind has created in terms of the planet, the environment, um, although I haven't read Professor Benatar's book, and I most certainly would love to read it and will make sure I do read it, um, and I don't know how he's approaching the subject, just what I've heard on the radio makes a whole lot of sense to me. Hmm. All right. Thank you very much. That's Sarah in Four Ways. And we go to Peter in Bryanston. Thanks for your patience. You've been holding on for so long. Welcome. Thank you, Reedy. And morning, Prof. Mm. I'm, yeah, I'm not qualified to be a father. In my opinion, I'm not qualified to be a father. Was not at that time. 
Hmm. And you've and never regretted... You have to take that decision to say, no, I don't want to be a father because I'm not qualified to do that. And so as a result of that, no, I haven't brought any new beings into existence. And you've never regretted that, Peter? No, because I've had my, my whole life to be able to look at it and say, how do I make the best of what I have in my life? Despite the world being a bad place and all the other things you might say about it. Yeah. Okay, that's that's Peter and Branson. Prof, I'm I'm just thinking. You know, people who 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 would overestimate the quality of life, or your motivational speakers, preachers, and many other people who encourage people to be positive, reach for your dreams. You know that uh, that 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 kind of language. If we're arguing that all our lives are very bad and generally much worse than we think, but isn't the counter argument that it's because of things that mankind have done that our lives are much worse than we think? So if we live, we have an opportunity to change all of that well I certainly think that humans have contributed their fair share of misery to the planet I more think than so. their fair share of misery to the planet but I think that even if we did everything right uh, nature is still constructed in such a way that there are going to be an immense amount of suffering hmm. it's just unavoidable it's written so deeply into the structure of sentient life that it's unavoidable we hmm. can minimize it or maximize it and I certainly think we should minimize the amount of pain that there is but we can't come even close to eliminating it all Let's go to Karen and David Klatso is also on the line from Rhonda Bosch. We'll talk to you in just a moment. Karen in Orange Grove, hi. Hi, hi. I find the subject absolutely fascinating. And while I do think that there probably should be fewer humans on the planet, um, I just wanted to refer to the book Conversations with God. I don't know if you've ever read it. We said that um, God could only experience existence having a body. So... Uh, what it, whatever whatever you experience in your life is part of God experience existence and you've got to experience existence so whatever it is whether it's suffering accidents pain um, wonderful things abundance all of those kind of things are just part of the experience so it's your experience of existence so everyone has to experience things and experience them to their fullest to to understand the point of existing at all are you better off though having experienced all those things I don't think it's a point that they're better off. It's a point of the fact that you have to experience it. Why? Because because God needed to experience it. The the, the beginning of the universe that that um, was nothingness had to experience the fact that it existed, and the only way that it could ever experience what it exists that it existence at all was through being solid, being existing, being but a, you, you, being a body, got, being something. But you've got to believe in God for you to take no, that kind no, of approach, even, isn't not it? Even that, 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 I mean, God is, a, I'm not talking about God as a as father figure, kind of religious figure. I'm talking about that existence that was nothingness before before there was existence. Hmm. Okay, well, Prof? See, that's where I think there's some confusion. I think it's a common confusion because <coughs> before anybody comes into existence, they aren't. And so there is nobody there who needs to experience anything. It's, it's, there's nobody there who needs to be brought into existence so as to obtain certain benefits or so as to understand anything better. Just to die again after all of that. Exactly. <laughs> all right, interesting. Let's go to David Klasso in Rondebosch. Good morning to you. Hello, Rudy. Hi. Hello, David. Morning. I, um, I enjoy the thought of your conversation as much as I enjoyed your inaugural lecture, and I must say, that it is a very courageous sort of uh, concept to tackle like this, mm. particularly publicly. But and I'm very pleased that your father didn't have the same views, David. However, <laughs> what I would like to say is this, is that pleasure and pain are really two sides of the same coin. And that I think that it's very difficult for me to conceive of one without the other. Uh, if life were one unending orgasm, I have no doubt that you'd be begging for it to stop. <laughs> And I think that quite often the vicissitudes of life create the strength which creates an enjoyment in the rest of life. And I think that it, it might be just a little negative to see life in terms of a purely selfish uh, concept of uh, am I going to get anything out of it or is life mundane or whatever. You, life is not mundane. Life, as far as I'm concerned, with all the pleasures and with all the pain of having existed has really created a, a sense of of unending enjoyment for me overall if I looked at it. So it's what I was talking about. It's a dark moment. But there have been some incredibly wonderful moments. Mm, it's exactly what I was and talking I about, David, the dichotomy surrounding our existence, the joy and the pain of it all. 
Absolutely. There are two sides in my view. I don't think you can ever have only joy without experience, experiencing pain. I think that the two have to be coexistent. But are you not better off not having experienced that pain? I, I guess that's what, well, it, that's what it is. Uh, you I, think, I think ultimately, if you look at it from an individual point of view, clearly, but if you look at it from a general point of view of the organism as a whole, I think that it, it, it's a wonderful theoretical situation, but it could obviously never exist because then mankind as, as we know it would come to an end. That's well. David Klatzow, yes, Prof? There are many ideas that have been raised. First of all, it wasn't me who said that our lives are mundane. I think it was one of the callers. So my argument's not based on that premise. Uh, secondly, I'm not sure that pain and pleasure are two sides of the same coin. Uh, I think that it is possible, firstly, to have pain without pleasure. There are some lives that are filled with unmitigated pain. There's just no pleasure. They don't last long enough for there to be any pleasure, and they're just painful. Uh, the other point that uh, Dr. Klatso made was that um, we can't have any pleasures. Uh, but that's exactly my point, is that given the nature of life, you can't live without having pain. And uh, I think that pain is all, is all gratuitous. He also suggests that this could never be because it would mean that there are no more humans. But uh, the sad news, presumably for him, for me, the good news, is that there will come a time when there are no more humans on the planet. Our species is going to go the route of every other species. We don't know when it's going to end. We don't know if it's going to be sooner or later. But one thing I know for absolute sure is that the later it happens, the more suffering there's going to be. Hmm. I'm going to. I want you. I want us to get into a, a longer discussion about that. It sounds to me that you hope one day, Prof, that all humans and other animals uh, must just go extinct. Well, of course, there are different ways of going extinct. I'm not recommending killing anybody or any animal. Uh, I don't want anybody to be killed off. But I think it would be better, all things considered, if we died off. And that is, in other words, if we didn't replace. Uh, uh, the current humans with new humans. Hmm. Let's take a break. We'll take more of your calls in a moment. Talk radio. Just to give you an idea of Professor David Benatar's book, he is the head of philosophy department at the University of Cape Town. The book is called Better Never to Have Been, The Harm of Coming into Existence. In Chapter 3, for example, he defends the idea that even the best lives are not only much worse than people think ordinarily, but also very bad in themselves. He argues by appealing to empirical research that people's self-assessments of the quality of their lives is, um, or are, I, I, I use the plural, right self-assessment is unreliable let's say self-assessment assessment is unreliable so the way we assess our lives the quality thereof is unreliable and uh, in this chapter he goes on to argue that the quality of human life is judged to be bad according to all three of the most common views of quality of life hedonistic view the desire fulfillment view and the objective list view the rest of the book defends a number of important practical implications of uh, his thesis so you may want to grab a copy uh, so we can grapple with with all of these let's go to david and kailami hi hi uh, yeah there are two points i want to make you know the one is is sort of one for mindfulness that uh, a lot of wisdom comes through working through things that may be unpleasant but the uh, more important one comes down to, it's the whole question of consciousness. And maybe I can give you the example of two cats that I had. Well, one my uncle had, and it was uh, from you, uh, you know, when it was about a year old, it was in an accident, a dog bit it, it was paralyzed from the waist down. We put it on a little trolley, and it was quite happy, purring everything. Uh, one of my cats got blinded, and within two days, he was jumping around the place. So I think a lot of our conception of what is pain mm. or displeasure comes from our consciousness of it. Yeah. You know, so similarly, you know, the professor is working in an area with a, from a scientific milieu with a certain position of consciousness that perceives certain things to be painful or unpleasant and others not. And to a large extent, I think it's the human consciousness and awareness of what is pain, what is displeasure that creates a lot of that, especially in a psychological level. Hmm. So, you know, to my mind, if somebody has a psychological appreciation of my life being pleasant or there being worthwhile things in my life, then de facto that makes that pleasant for the person. You know, I don't know that we can really compare so-called uh, epistemological or empirical proofs 
to say that you're wrong. Mm -hmm. You think your life is pleasant, but it actually isn't pleasant. Okay, that's David and Kailami. Lovely call. Uh, Prof, I'll tell you what, can I take a few more calls and then sure. we can respond to everyone all together as well as wrap sure. up the people who've been holding on for so long. Sipo in Midrand, hi. Hi, uh, the name is Jeff Ikele Rudy. Um, I understand the concerns that have been raised about uh, our general quality of life, but there's a statement uh, that when you start a new life, you're actually starting a new center of, of, of suffering. I don't, I, don't, I don't agree with. We can't really say now we, we're going to dis discourage starting a new life because of the possibility of, of suffering. I'm the, of the opinion that um, uh, the value of life is actually realized in, in the meaning of life. So the sooner you, you find the meaning of your life, the sooner you can, you can actually realize the value. And how much suffering was incurred in that lifetime or that existence mm -hmm. becomes really trivial. Okay, that's the point. Midrand Ligao in Edenvale. Hi. Hello. I wanted to find out from the professor what criteria he's using to determine um, how worse our lives are because um, I'm thinking there are some things that you can experience in life that can put you in a position whereby you become oblivious to the negative things that, are, that you experience in life. You know? mm -hmm. I don't know if that's clear. Okay, Prof? Okay, well, that question and the first one are, are actually connected. Uh, the criteria that I'm using are actually three different criteria because they're three different ways in which philosophers have assessed quality of life. The one is based on how much pleasure there is in a life. The one is on the extent to which one's desires are fulfilled. And the third one is the extent to which one's life meets certain objective conditions. And what I try to do is I try to step through each of those different theories and show how irrespective of which of those views you take, our lives are nonetheless very bad. Now to connect that to the first questioner, uh, he's quite correct that if you have an optimistic view on life and you view your pains in a certain way, that there's an extent to which they're made less bad than they otherwise would be. But what he's actually describing is a phenomenon that's known as adaptation. And what that mm -hmm. means is that if something bad happens to you, you actually adjust to it and it, you, you now no longer ex expect to have anything better than that. And, and that means that a lot of the bad things in our lives we, we actually overlook because we've adapted to them. Uh, there's, there's very good evidence, for example, that people who are disabled in accidents, at first their self-assessment of the quality of their life dips. They think their lives have now become much worse. But they adapt to the new condition very often, and then they return to the sort of baseline view of how good their life is afterwards. Mm. And this applies to many, many bad things that happen to people. So if you look at how their lives are actually going, uh, it's not very good, but they've adapted it in such a way that they think it's better than it really is. You're listening to Reedy Direco. Some SMSs very quickly. This life is spirit, continues into another life. Craig says there's life drive and a death drive is day and night. Both are valid. We must try to have harmony between the two. A very good discussion. Thanks. Reedy, the professor is right. There is futility in existence. We're better off if we don't experience some of this pain. Uh, and uh, one says, I swear I've never heard such an amount of hogwash that's innocent in Protea Glen. Regarding your last caller, how many millions must die of hunger before God gets enough of the experience? I like the fact that we are grappling with... Jeez, I use the word grappling, so every second person is using grappling. I actually hate it. But anyway, Professor, you know, I must be honest. I I'm actually surprised at the number of people who have sent emails and calls in support of your argument. I mean, is this, is this the sign of the times? I, I don't know. I actually thought that your views were so controversial that many people will be slamming you. There are some who are critical, and that's fine. All of them should articulate their views but I, I, I'm taken aback by the number of people who are saying actually it's true I must say I'm a little surprised too how many people have called in in favor I think there may be an explanation for that it might be that these sorts of views are so rarely discussed in public and they so frowned upon that uh, this opportunity on the radio to talk about them has brought people out of their shell and enabled them to, to speak about ideas that ordinarily are taboo. Mm, mm, mm. And I won't forget that you're saying those who never exist cannot be deprived Exactly. Thank you. Yes, you, you, wanted, you wanted to say something? I, I wanted to respond to one of the earlier callers mm. who said that uh, he disagreed that when we create a new being, a new human being, we're creating a new centre center of suffering. He said uh, we shouldn't be worried about a mere possibility of, of suffering. But in fact, it's absolutely guaranteed it that every guarantee. person that we bring into existence will suffer in some or other way. Mm. And another caller of yours spoke about uh, the meaning of life. And uh, I would just say that for your life to have meaning, of course, you have to have a life. And so it's not problematic if those who never exist don't have any meanings in their lives because they don't have any lives. <laughs> All right, Professor, I really have loved chatting to you and I'm sure we'll do so again. Good luck with the book, eh? 
Thanks very much. Nice to chat to you and Thank your callers. Thank you so very much. And those of you who are SMSing, the book is called Better Never to Have Been, The Harm of Coming into Existence by Professor David Benatar.